Okay, thank you. Um, so I want to talk about uh, zero knowledge machine learning and my sound bite about it is that we're trying to give the blockchain eyes. Um, so as you all know, uh, a zero knowledge proof is to a digital signature as Ethereum is to Bitcoin. It lets us put any function, take the signature function and replace it with any program. And the thesis here is that the most interesting program to stick into a zero knowledge proof is going to be a machine learning program. And that's because it effectively makes it as though our little model or AI is running on chain. Um, so I think of it as a way to give kind of sense organs, eyes and ears and a sense of touch maybe even um, to the blockchain. Um, and why would we want to do that? I think the long term thing is something like, you know, after two of us have met and we've talked for an hour, if I meet you again in two years um, and I say, oh, I'd like to send uh, 10 Ethereum to my friend over here, you would be able to authenticate me, decide that that was my true intent and that I'm me. And the fact that we can't do that kind of authentication yet um, uh, is just a technical problem. And I think the key to solving that problem is to put uh, a huge ensemble of AI models into zero knowledge proofs and check them on chain. Um, and that's what I mean by making it possible for a human rather than a field element to take control of their digital assets, of their sort of destiny. Um, and it lets us uh, make smart contracts that can deal with fuzzy situations, exercise judgment. Um, for example, in the legal situation that we heard about earlier, um, that's the kind of judgments we would like things to make. You know, decide if a news story says something, decide if uh, a, a DAO contributor has done what they said they were going to do. Um, and kind of the really big picture thing is that we've been, enables us to create an unstoppable, permissionless, on-chain AI that nobody can turn off. You know, what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, okay, so more practically, what we've been doing is to create a a uh, command line tool that lets you take an Onyx model, which is a way to freeze a neural network into an output format, uh, created in PyTorch or something like that, and create a uh, zero knowledge proof with a little command line call, or a, a proof and a verification tool um, targeting different execution environments. We're adding a lot of uh, day la uh, uh, layers, uh, performance is improving, performance is still terrible, but it's getting better uh, because we're focused on feature completeness and we've been Building in the open uh, since July, uh, it's Apache licensed if you want to check it out. Um, and just to give you a sense of what we're doing, so here's an example of a function which is defined in Python. Uh, it's a forward pass in a model, so it starts with some inputs and produces some outputs. And here, these tensors x, y, and z are tables tensors that are defined at runtime um, rather than um, at the time that the circuit uh, is created in Rust. Uh, and then it could take this, you know, function that you've expressed in Python or what you want to do. You can think about writing NumPy or writing PyTorch, and then it translates it, you know, lays it out into a table um, and designs a quantization strategy and turns it into a, uh, something that can be proved. Um, and we're using Halo 2 in the back end. Um, what uh, the kind of things we can do is to load the model and print that table you just saw, do mock proofs, and full proofs, um, which are both, both sort of for testing, prove, serialize the proof into a, into a little JSON file, um, verify against that, um, and, and help. And then there's a way to also change the, uh, change the back end if you want to switch between the native IPA pasta curves of Halo 2 and the KZG-based uh, system that, that privacy scale and explorations and scroll has built. Um, so uh, and you input a model from an Onyx file. You can produce a proof, uh, serialize it into a proof file. Um, you can uh, verify that proof file. Uh, right now, you just pass the model in again um, and you know, see that it works. Um, so uh, let me talk about a little bit about the timeline, so like where, how we've gotten here. So we started in July, um, and we were able to put an MNIST into a SNARK using nonlinearities, uh, using the lookup tables in Halo 2 to do no, build nonlinearities, um, and EVM verification of a single model using the privacy scaling explorations team's work. Um, and we did spend a lot of time kind of refactoring and making it into a general purpose thing that can ingest arbitrary tensors and trying to make a really good developer experience. Like we've heard a lot about at this meeting, it's really important for us to produce tools that make it easy to use zero knowledge even if you don't want to deal with the underlying cryptography. I think there's a lot of people that are in that situation. Um, so uh, we've also done some sort of technical stuff about fusing operations, and I'll speak about that more in a moment. 
Um, and recently we've added this proof system abstraction and uh, EVM for general models. Um, enough ops, so the, the stage we're sort of at now, just to give you a picture, is that we can kind of load mobile net but not quite run it. Other folks who have optimized specifically for that can get that to run. So that's kind of where we are now, roughly, in terms of size. Expect that to keep getting better. Um, and we've added uh, uh, this thing, uh, tolerance. So one of the things that happens with quantization is that you're always... Um, have numerical errors, because we're representing fixed, uh, floating point arithmetic with a fixed point approximation. Um, but of course, you don't actually have to run it in the snark. You just have to check that your witness is correct, basically. Um, and so you have some room to add tolerance and kind of bring things back into alignment uh, periodically, or at least at the end. And in the future, we'll be working on optimization, recursion, um, and for supporting more execution environments. Um, so let me say a couple of words about quantization. So a big challenge with this stuff is just the strategy you use to turn, to represent what was originally a 32 or 16-bit floating point arithmetic uh, using the fixed point arithmetic in the field. Um, it sounds very easy, and it's kind of easy to do manually, but it's a, a pretty tricky to think through a strategy that will work for, for whatever models you throw at it. So a lot of our effort right now is spent on that. Um, there's definitely some space-time trade-offs. Um, and you know, this general quantization strategy it requires more thought than you like, it, but it's a, it's a fun set of problems. And I think there's actually going to be some interesting numerical work and maybe some mathematical innovation around that. And right now we're taking sort of a type theoretic approach where we, we think of the scale or the denominator as kind of a type and you bring things into the same type and then if, you, if it doesn't work or you overflow, you go back and re-quantize and, and, and rethink it. Um, okay, so, so let me say a little bit more about kind of why we're doing this. So, I think about one of the most exciting applications as being scalable oracles. So they have three stages. You ingest some data. Hopefully it's been signed or somehow attested to or it comes from a chain. You run a model, a text model, an image classification model, whatever, and then you verify it on chain and then it kind of becomes truth again and you can feed it back into the loop. Um, so the first stage of that, it makes the most sense if there's this chain of custody before I run the model. So you could imagine uh, so Sony makes a camera now that signs images as they're created. Um, we would like everyone to sign their HTTP responses. That would be fairly trivial to do, and lots of people have sort of promised to do it but haven't actually really started to do it yet. Uh, email has a signature that you can check. Publishers uh, will hopefully start doing that, and there are a few people who've promised to do it or started to do it as third-party notaries, which you can either do in MPC by doing your TLS handshake in MPC, or you can just have a proxy, depending on how much you trust. Um, anyway, we can do it. I think we need kind of an industry-wide push that's a little bit like HTTPS to get people to start doing that um, so that our, our data is ZK ready. So here's an example of people that have promised to sign their data and mostly haven't started doing it. Um, okay, so then the next stage is to take a model that's interesting and run it, a text model or a classification model, make a decision about this input. Um, and where we are now in terms of the pipeline is uh, you know, we can't do much, <laughs> but what we do is we, we look at the zoo of Onyx models, the, you know, all the things that have gone through the history of machine learning, we download the next one, we try to get it to work by solving scalability problems, adding nodes we need to add, uh, that kind of thing. Um, think about quantization strategy and repeat. So that's how we're doing it. And there are a lot of tools we have, a lot of hammers that are going to make this happen very fast, continue to happen very fast. And probably eventually even catch up with the state of the art in machine learning, possibly as soon as a year or two from now. So there's optimization, which is just being more careful about the proving system, being more careful about the layout, just the sort of normal performance optimization work you would do. Um, but then there are these big tools, aggregation, you know, being able to do proof aggregation or accumulation, uh, which I think we'll talk about later. Um, Combining, you can think about this, a simple way to think about this in the machine learning context is maybe tiling, you know, like breaking up an ar a, a large layer into a bunch of small pieces and checking them all at once. Um, recursion, that lets us do one layer at a time. If I can fit one layer in memory in a proof, then that's all I really need if I can check it before I run the next layer. Um, fusion, which means, by which I mean taking, uh, arguments and replacing them with something new. So the naive matrix multiplication argument, which is what we use now, is you just write out the dot product, 
and you say this is equal to the thing it's supposed to be equal to, but of course you can replace that with a more sophisticated matrix multiplication um, like the one from Thaler 13 for, for, to, to compress that whole large tensor contraction or matrix multiplication into, into just one argument. So that will provide a lot of probably speed up if it works. Um, and then finally, composition, which is to say, you know, maybe there are some components of our computational graph that are faster in some proof systems. Once we have the cross verifiers built, then um, we can make use of that. Uh, and so aggregation, of course, looks something like this. You have a, a hard, uh, easy to make, but hard to verify proof. It gets verified, it gets compressed on a big server into something that's uh, hard to make, but easy to verify. You might require a terabyte RAM machine to do that, where the, the first stage hopefully runs on a mobile phone. And then finally, you, you have something small enough to check on chain. Um, so in terms of an intermediate representation, it's kind of a weird choice, right? So we're saying this is something that's much higher level than, than something that is expressed in terms of polynomials. Um, but I think it makes sense, both because we can do this we, we've preserved the intent of the original programmer. And so if we come up with better arguments, we can swap them out. And the person that created the Onyx file doesn't have to know or care that we've made those changes. So it leaves us a lot more room for sort of cryptographic improvements than a lower level intermediate representation. And the other thing that's kind of convenient is that this idea of uh, computational graphs in TensorFlow and PyTorch is possibly the most widely used and well-known circuit notation that exists in the wild. Right? Like people are used to thinking about computational graphs, and they've already come out, and so there's like a low impedance mismatch with taking those computational graphs that are already baked and just turning them into zero knowledge proofs. So we're targeting people from coming from the Python ecosystem. Here's a picture of that. We have a computational graph which has been fixed by the end user, um, baked into TyTorch or Onyx. Our compiler, which is called Ezekiel, um, that uh, fuses operations and writes it down into a proof system, and then it, it, we think about the, the proof system as a compile target. So you know, as we've heard, there's, I, there's now a proof system coming out approximately every week. Uh, it's been a very stressful fall. I'm trying to decide what proof system we should invest in next, right? Because we spent a lot of time on Halo 2. Uh, if anyone has opinions on that, or even better, an opinion that you'd like to um, collaborate on, on integrating your proof system, please talk to me, because I would love to to have someone who really understands uh, a system to help us to add that as a target, compile target. I think about it like an architecture, right? There's a, there's a sense in which proof systems are like hardware. Um, but that lets us make this chaos for the next five years and let end users literally use the same file that they made you know, three years ago, which I think is a satisfying experience for them. Um, uh, I already talked a little bit about the abstraction and fusion. Um, because we have a deeper understanding of the intent, um, the user can just get uh, performance uh, improvement. And then on-chain verification, uh, the way we have it working now is using the privacy scaling explorations team work with aggregators. Um, and so right now it takes six, a little less than 600,000 gas now, uh, but this machine has to be quite large. So just for the MNIST model, it takes around 500 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and that's mostly because of my poor optimization of the circuit. So it, it'll come down, but uh, it works. Um, yeah, so at the end we get this kind of high volume on-chain data feed where um, instead of, say, a uh, human version where you have human beings that make a judgment about whether what an article says or what happened or, what, or whether someone met their contractual obligations, and then other humans judge those humans, and there's this whole complex cryptoeconomic system to decide, you know, is this thing true or not? Now, if there's signed data, we can have a situation where someone downloads an article from Bloomberg or whatever, constructs the proof, uploads the result to the chain, and then it, everyone can rely on that result, um, at least to the extent they could rely on the source. Um, and so that lets us do a, a much more scalable way of getting data uh, on chain than, than the um, individual uh, strategy. Um, so on the chain side, I really believe that uh, zero knowledge machine learning is going to be table stakes over the next few years um, because of this identity solution. So having a decentralized identity solution that lets you control uh, your smart contracts or your wallet in the same way that you think about um, 
you control your ordinary assets, you can talk to your banker and recover your funds even though your house burned down. Um, that's something we can enable in a decentralized way using this technology once it's built and running and tested and smoke tested. Um, and that's crucial for scalability and this Oracle idea really opens the fire hose. Um, and finally, this model is kind of a smart judge that you can use to interpret events. Um, and I have some more uh, application examples, but I'm out of time, so I'm gonna stop now and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Questions? Um, this use of um, zero knowledge proofs to reason about uh, images in your example um, it reminds me of a work from a few years ago called Photoproof which likewise reasons about uh, the images, uh, assuming that they are suitably signed. In that case, uh, motivated by a different setting, that of verifying their integrity, uh, rather than ML techniques. Um, mm. Some of the considerations come up again, including the need for someone to sign them in the first place. So if any of those people who are promised to start signing um, actually follows up, there would be multiple applications for that and extra motivation for them to do so. More questions? So uh, I think it's fascinating uh, work, but the, uh, so uh, I think one of the, you know, maybe the big differences between AI and human, for human, uh, AI, excuse me, natural stupidity, is, uh, is that natural stupidity keeps learning over time, and AI models are fixed, right? Mm. Uh, uh, and that's part of like, you know, contr you know contract, uh, you know, dispute resolution stuff, for the, the, the consideration of humans that they keep learning. Is there a way to introduce, uh, you know, machine learning that keeps learning into the blockchain in this way? In yeah, way? I mean, I, I mean, you, I mean, the, the simple way is just to, you know, let the contract be updated under under some conditions, right? So I imagine oh, the maybe the contract can be stay can stay, but the, the machine learning the, the, yeah, the, 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 the determines the, tests, the, the, the yeah the model gets updated. Um, I tend to think about yeah, like the the long term identity solution as being every person has their own kind of giant semaphore instance. Mm -hmm. And there's maybe 10,000 factors of your identity or something. And if over time some of those factors you know, don't perform as well and get dropped off, then new factors get added on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's also, of course, people thinking about federated learning and, and doing, uh, doing the learning itself um, using ZK proofs. So that, that's also a, possibil a possibility. But I think the overhead is large enough there that that's mm -hmm. going to be some time. Thanks. Yeah, and then the, and another question, you know, is. Uh, what would be your first killer app? I think the same thing that I've been asking, you know. You know yeah, you right, so. Put so the, the shoe through the door, right? Yeah, my There's next slide is, see. so I think the first killer app will probably be zero knowledge uh, uh, KYC. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I know enough about RegTech, that's not gonna be compliant, okay. but what it is is it's kind of, might be enough to prevent, uh, to reduce fraud. And okay. to, you know, in, in the tornado, I think about the tornado cash case. If they had done a zero knowledge machine, a uh, zero knowledge KYC thing where you have to prove I'm the person that matches this ID, my ID is not in a sanctions database, mm -hmm. it might have been enough to keep the bad actors out such that it was a low enough percentage that no one wanted to shut it okay. down. And I think that's probably the first, I see. the first thing that will be really exciting for people. Um, you don't know anything about them other than that they're not in the database. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Thank you.